Stan Lee once said, if you're interested in what you do, that keeps you going. He also said, the world has always been a comic book world to me. Every comic book character has an origin story, a story that introduces the reader to our hero and explains who they are and how they came to be. This story is no different. This story is about a boy who grew up in Connecticut, reading and drawing and writing comics, developing his talents that would one day lead him to fulfill his own destiny. This is the story of the creator of Terrificon. This is the origin story of Mitch Halleck. Hello class. I'm your professor, Mitch Halleck, and I'm going to teach you all about Terrificon, Connecticut's Terrific Comic Con. T-E-R-R-I-F-I-C-O-N. Terrificon, and it's happening July 29th to the 31st at the Mohegan Sun in lovely Uncasville, Connecticut. Tickets are on sale right now. Well, I grew up here. I was born at Yale New Haven Hospital. Birthplace of the lollipop, the erector set, uh, Frisbee was from here. The first hamburger is over here at Lou's Lunch. Used to be able to drive through here, but they stopped that long ago. Yes, I was born here July 10th, 1966, in the town of New Haven. I lived in West Haven, which is the town next to it. There's three surrounding towns, East Haven, West Haven, and North Haven. There is no South Haven because that's under the water, my dad would say. So anyway, New Haven is a great place to grow up because around the corner was the Yale Peabody Museum that I used to go to as a kid. There's a big brontosaurus, well, they call it a brontosaurus back then. That's there, there's a meteorite, uh, meteorite. there's a mummy. So as a kid, my grandmother would take me to that because it was free. And then around the corner from that was the movie theater that I'd go see, Indiana Jones. And then around that was the comic book shop. So imagine growing up with all this educational stuff and then you get all this fantasy world and right here in the middle I was just lost in a sea of confliction. Should I be realistic and go study and become like a smart person or should I just go delve into the world of fantasy? And now I'm doing both. Uh, yeah, Terrific Con came about because as a comic book fan since I was wee high I wanted to go to a show that was everything that I was all about, everything that I enjoyed. I mean, movies, TV, toys, comics, and more. And I've been going to cons since I was about nine, and I'd see them evolve and what they'd turn into over the last 15 or 20 years. And it went from being a communal experience to more of a marketplace, you know? And I didn't really like what I saw, so I said, you know what? If I was in charge, what would I do? You know, if I was king for the day. So what I did is I got the opportunity to organize and produce my own comic book show. And I did what I like to do. And that was simple. It was just getting artists and writers in a room with a bunch of fans. And then they were just going to sit there and talk about why they love comic books. Why they sat there and read them day after day, year after year, decade after decade. And before you know it, terrific con magic happened right then and there. Though it took a couple years for it to become what it is now, the multi-day extravaganza, the giant expo center at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut, it's all about fandom. That's it, I can't put it any other way. It's just about having a good time, having a great value, bringing your friends, getting together. It's like a family reunion. Every year I feel like the proud papa who gets all his kids together at Christmas or Thanksgiving and they all sit around the table and they all talk about what they've been up to over the last year. And we've had people get engaged at Terrificon. We've had people get married at Terrificon. It's not about expensive photo shoots. It's not about, uh, you know, overpriced toys or props or things like that. It's just about getting together for a three-day love fest. It's like the Woodstock of comic book fandom. I was an usher at the Palace Theater. I got to see a bunch of free concerts. I saw George, I would see comedians. I saw George Carlin, Robert Klein, uh, Rodney Dangerfield. I would, other people would go to rock concerts. I would go to comedian uh, comic shows. And I saw Steve Martin, my very first concert ever, right down the street at the New Haven Coliseum in 1978. 
the Let's Get Small tour. My grandmother took me, it was $7 a ticket. I still have the t-shirt, it doesn't fit me. I don't have my grandmother anymore, but I still have the shirt. So. My mom, my dad was wacky, but you'd never know it because he was a quiet guy. He was in the Marine Corps and he was a construction worker and he never said boo to anybody. So you're like, that guy? But he would watch uh, Peter Sellers movies. And he used to let me stay up to watch Saturday Night Live, Second City. He would be like, oh, it's all right. Even if it was 1130 at night, I was a five-year-old kid. And I'm watching Johnny Carson. My dad's like, let him watch the monologue, then he can go to bed. It's literally quarter of 12 at night and I'd go to bed and then wake up at seven in the morning to go to Catholic school and tell my friends about this other world that existed after eight or nine o'clock because they all were in bed like they should have been at a reasonable hour. But my dad was like, yeah, let him stay up. So I would literally sit on the floor and draw comic strips all night long and then watch, look it up from the floor, the Johnny Carson show. And then my dad's like, okay, go to bed before your mom gets mad. This is uh, St. Brendan's Church, or it used to be St. Brendan's Church. We're on the corner of Whaley and Ellsworth Avenue. And I went to school here, uh, first through eighth grade. My sisters went to school here. No, and I remember the corner there where there was a drugstore, and I used to get Spider-Man comics there. I remember my grandmother picking me up, and she gave me a dollar. And I ran into the store, and I picked up a giant-sized Tarzan, which was like 80 pages. It was like 60 cents. And I remember this kid, Danny Seals and Eric Salters, if you're out there, you stole my Spider-Man meets the lizard. It was a Christmas issue. I had it in my hand right there, in my hand. And they ran by and they snagged out of my hand and took off. Going to Catholic school, it's a very conservative world. So when you come up with wacky ideas, you're like, you're like a rebel, you know? My friend, Al Pilato, he and I would read comics. He'd sit on one side of the classroom and I'd sit on the other. We're always in the back of the room because that way the teacher couldn't see what you were doing. Instead of learning about Jesus and the Bible, I was in the back of the room drawing my uh, Crusher comics right over there and uh, playing in this playground. And it's funny that Mike DiCarlo, who's coming to the show, who actually did become a DC comic book artist, went to school here with my sister and he lived around the corner and he went to the same grammar school, we went to the same high school, we even went to the same college. And then he went to go work for DC Comics and he's a big famous artist, Mike DiCarlo. He'll be a terrific time this year. You talk to him, he'll tell you about growing up here. So I would take my uh, composition book, you know those black and white yep. books? And they're already bound, so it's like it's perfect for a comic book. So I would start my story and I'd write and draw it. Mine was Crusher Comics, it was about a wrestler and I'd give it to him and he'd do Mr. Smith comics, which was because he couldn't draw, he would just draw stick figures, but his stories were hysterical. So he would pass it on to me. So we would literally sit there and on the way from one side of the room to the other side of the room, the other kids would intercept it and they would take it and they'd read the stories and, oh, and then they'd pass it on. And then we did that for years. I think we got up to like 500 or 600 issues, which were just basically pieces of paper front and back. And then over the summer, we didn't see each other because he lived over in another part of New Haven and I lived over towards the beach. So I would write all these stories over the summer so when we got back in the fall, it's like, here, look at all the books I wrote, you know? Weird. I dressed as Shazam for the Halloween party and my mom left me at the phone booth and she still talks about that. In New Haven, seven years old, at night. It's my mom. Yeah, it's not St. Brendan's name, it's more. No, I'm filming something for the show. How are you feeling? You all right today? I'm at, you know what? You'll never guess where I am right now. St. Brendan School. I'm in front. We're filming something for the show. I was just telling them when you called about how you left me dressed as Shazam in the phone booth down the street. Yeah, that's, that's right. She said, that's right. And I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. She goes, you're still here. <laughs> yeah. What left, are the odds? Left me there. <laughs> in some kind of like they're old but there's a portal in their shed and they can go back to our another planet light years away i don't know it's part know one of it's six I, it, it's a slow burn i'll tell you that the green lantern yeah, phil lamar he'll be a terrific guy i've got uh 10 by 10 inline boots left all the corners are gone all the islands are gone all the artist alley tables are gone I got about 10 booths left. Now we're at lovely Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut. OCK. Southern, if you're listening, 
I'm waiting for my doctorate, my doctor of humanities. Besides being an art student, I was the publicity director for the Crescent Players, which is the Southern Connecticut Theater Group. I guess that's where I learned my, uh, my early steps in being a promoter because I used to have to promote the plays. And then I would do the poster art because I was the art major. So for the glass menagerie, I made this glass unicorn and, did, and then our town. I was in the plays and I would make the, uh, the posters. And then I'd go around town putting all the posters up. You know what's so weird now that I think about this talking to you, I've been doing this my whole life. Now that I think about it, I used to draw the comic strip, drive around campus and tack it up everywhere. I used to do the theater and make the posters to promote the shows drive around New Haven, put signs up about the theater. What do I do when I do this now? I make posters, I drive around Connecticut, and I put up things about Terrificon. I, I guess I've been doing this for like 30 something years now. That'll work. Did the comic strips, did that stuff in school, high school, artist of the year, won all that jazz. Got to college, became the cartoonist for the newspaper, got fired because they didn't like some of the jokes. And I didn't mean to like offend anybody, but they said they were too like in. You know. And then I'd come up with a new series, and then they'd hire me back, and then I'd get fired. And then I did it again. I did it three times, and then I gave up because every time I would get a good strip going and people liked it, they would get mad about something I did, and then they'd pull it and they said they couldn't print it. So I finally figured it out. I worked at a copy shop and I started writing and drawing my own comic strip called The Adventures of Mitch and Murley about me and my uh, uh, poli sci friend. He became a lawyer. He was very uh, conservative. He smoked a cigar, wore a raincoat, looked like Columbo and he seemed like a 60-year-old man trapped in a 20-year-old man's body. And the two of us would do plays even though we weren't theater majors only because the really cute girls were in theater class and, uh, you know, we were looking for, you know, to go out on dates. Interaction. Interaction. And that's how I met my wife, but who will be my wife. And he met his wife there too, so it worked. It was like before they had uh, Tinder. Tinder, you would go and join the community theater. You'd swipe stage left. You'd swipe stage left, swipe stage right. The public access show is Mitch and Merle. I think you could find episodes on YouTube. You know, I, honestly, I can't remember how we started it. We just. And we were always just goofing around and talking about situations where what if this happened or what if that happened then we just decided to start to film them i mean you could use many many words to describe mitch phony would not be one of them it couldn't be if you know him at, at all you'd know there's just absolutely nothing fake or phony about him what you see is what you get that's what you when you deal with him in, in any capacity, that's him. He doesn't put on airs, he doesn't play a role. His core personality never changes. Very authentic, very real, very nice guy. I was there in the theater department. I used to be in plays and they go, why are you here? I said, I don't know if that's a nice thing or a mean thing, but the guy would say, you should be doing something else. I don't know exactly what that is. Even every job I've had, like the boss would come in and sit me down and go, can we talk about you? I go, uh-oh. You're very talented, but you're wasting your talents here. You should be somewhere else. So I'm still trying to find out where that is. I wonder what I'll be doing when I'm 55 years old, said young Mitch Halleck in 1989 when he graduated. Right here, actually. I, my graduation was right here. It was 100 degrees, hot as hell in June. Or was it May? No, it was May. Might have been today. I don't remember. My dad gave me a hundred bucks. I was like, okay. And when did you get the blue suitcase? I got the blue suitcase. That was my dad's. Uh, he used it in the Marine Corps. And it used to be in the closet in my mom's bedroom. And they didn't go anywhere. We never took vacations. I went to Mystic Seaport. I never went on a vacation. And because uh, we lived there at the beach. My dad's like, you go to the beach. You don't need to go anywhere. You got the ocean. And the suitcase was his suitcase that he used in the Marine Corps. And I would just take it and load it with comic books. In fact, my friend Al that I talked about earlier that stole my comics lived right across the street from Southern over there on Diamond Street. 
and uh, we used to go hang out in the swamp that's right behind there. He called it Makandi Duwagi Swamp. He would make up these names. He was very weird like that. I don't know where he'd get these names from. But anyway, we would read comics right over there and we'd watch all the kids come to the Southern. And I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna go to somewhere far away. Mm -hmm, whatever. Life doesn't work out like you think. But if I went somewhere else, I would have never met my wife. And I met her right in that building right there. I wasn't good at school at all. I was what they call a ne'er do well. I think that means never do well. But I never, I never took Latin. So I said to my mom, Mom, what's my special talent? She said, Son, you don't have any special talent. So I said, Well, I could always become a Comic Con uh, producer. And she goes, You can only become a terrific one. So that's what I did. And here I am now, 25 years old, and uh, looking like this. This is Mitch Halleck uh, of Big Fedora Marketing, producer of comic conventions in Connecticut. Superheroes and comic book fanatics alike are going to be uniting forces at Terrificon. You looking for some words of wisdom? I don't have any, Tom. S staring at me. Why comics? Why comics, Why kids? comics? Oh, why comics? Yeah. Because of the world's greatest art form, world's greatest entertainment. You can take it home with you. You can read it again and again and again. You can sell it. You can give it to your buddies. You can look at the pictures if you don't know how to read. Comics keep you young. That's why they're important. They keep you young and broke. That's right. <laughs> it's like it's like drug addiction. It's like alcohol, but it doesn't kill your liver or your brain cells. It just keeps you home. It was cheap entertainment. We didn't have VCRs or any of that stuff when we were a kid. Summertime met sitting on the porch with a stack of comic books because there was no air conditioning, and that's what you would do. They never get old. That's why I like comics. Tell Mitch I need a free pass, oh, and I will so. definitely so. come, and I will harass him you know, as much as possible, all three days. I'll embarrass him, like, you know, as usual. And we'll have a grand old time. Okay. See, this is what it's say like. that one more time. You should make a documentary on this stuff. A great event for fans of superheroes, sci-fi, horror, and anime. Everything works out like it's supposed to, you know? And that's that. Since 2012, Mitch Halleck has brought together families, friends, artists, and creators from all over the globe. The legacy that is Terrificon was started with passion and has grown into a unique event that speaks to the child in all of us. Terrificon is for those of us who created heroes in school notebooks or turned our backyard imaginations into realities. There is only one place to experience magic like this, and that is Terrificon. There is only one man that could have created such an incredible event. Mitch Halleck.